join me in welp welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. John Garrick. Thank you, Susan. My, I didn't think there would be this many people interested in this topic. I'm, <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very impressed and certainly on the spot. Uh, what I'd like to do tonight is uh, chat qu quite informally about the business of uh, cer the search for a way to solve, in a permanent way, the nuclear waste problem, particularly with respect to the so-called high-level waste, and I'll define that in a minute. So uh, as far as what I intend to cover, here are the topics. I will not be covering them as discreetly and cleanly as they're presented here because I'll be uh, going back and forth on the issues in an attempt to make it as interesting as possible. But when I'm finished, I should have covered uh, some, most aspects of, of these topics. So the first thing is uh, the U.S. Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what the heck is the waste problem anyhow, uh, its magnitude, um, why it's uh, turned out to be as uh, complicated as it, it, as it is, and where we are now with respect to uh, uh, the issue. And finally, I, I will be talking a little bit about uh, my view, and only my view. I'm not here representing the board, the technical review board. I'm representing myself. And besides, uh, my term just expired. I served on the board as its chairman for uh, two terms, eight years. I'm told by my colleagues that I'm a few days I served a few days longer than any previous chairman, and that was only because the administration was a little slow in making the new appointments. Uh, I'd like to uh, end with some discussion of um, my views on where I think we probably should go in, in the waste uh, uh, business. So with respect to the U.S. Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board, it's a very interesting board. Uh, one of the members of the board uh, has made the observation that it's a board that has uh, no authority and reports to no one. Uh, we uh, were established by the 1987 Nuclear Waste Policy Amendment Act. Uh, it is, in fact, more than just a presidential board. It, it is an independent agency in the executive branch. It consists of 11 uh, distinguished scientists and engineers who uh, were appointed by the president. Um, the president looks to the National Academy of Sciences for candidates. Uh, the National Academy provides at least two candidates for each available position. And then it's up to the White House as to what uh, the final selection should be. It is a board that uh, works very hard to be apolitical and to be independent. And in that regard, I think the board has been extremely successful. It seems to be one of the institutions or one of the few institutions that the public uh, trusts and tends to look to for objective and independent views of, uh, of the problems. Uh, it has had a major impact on the national program in spite of its uh, lack of authority and reporting p uh, position. Uh, it's, we have testified before Congress a number of times. Uh, we supply re two reports a year to Congress and the Secretary of Energy outlining exactly what uh, our views are with respect to the manner in which, uh, in this case, the uh, Department of Energy is implementing uh, the, the Nuclear Waste uh, Policy Act. That's the, ch chief, the chief function of the committee or of the board is to provide oversight to uh, the organization that's implementing uh, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982. So uh, with respect to the 1982 Nuclear Waste Policy Act, uh, that is the act that committed uh, the nation to uh, uh, develop a uh, uh, geologic disposal facility for a permanent separation of the waste from from the biosphere and, and from uh, any living beings. And uh, the uh, idea and the suggestion in the 
uh, Act was that we should develop two repositories, one in the East and one in the West. But as soon as the Act was in, uh, enacted, there was controversy, and there was struggles, and there was debates. And it turned out to be a far bigger problem than I think Congress had anticipated. And so they decided, well, we'll eliminate one of the uh, uh, programs. And the one they chose to eliminate, of course, was the East. We call that the Eastern bias. And, uh, uh, and in the meantime, the process was uh, in, in underway. Uh, a number of science, uh, sites in both the East and the West in the early days, in the early 1980s, had been identified for a study and, and review. And given that uh, the decision was then made to not include the eastern sites, there were down to three western sites uh, that uh, they wanted to characterize and develop to a point where the best site manifested itself clearly and then make the selection. The three western sites were to be uh, an, a, a site in the state of Washington, not far from the Hanford uh, Works in a geologic formation known as basalt, a site in northern Texas uh, uh, which, where the geologic formation was a layered uh, salt site, and the site at, at the Nevada test site uh, and the, the Yucca, known as the Yucca Mountain site where uh, the geologic medium was uh, tough. That is to say, it was uh, uh, ash from uh, ancient volcanoes that uh, were deposited and compacted. Uh, and uh, this was the material that was judged to be an adequate uh, location for the waste. It was also a very dry site, an arid area, and the uh, horizon for the emplacement tunnels was about 1,000 feet above the saturated zone, so it was in, it was in an unsaturated zone and about 1,000 feet below the surface of, of the mountain. Uh, the problem was that Congress got impatient, and they decided to do some more uh, short cutting of the whole process and made the decision that uh, they would characterize only one site, and that site was the uh, uh, Yucca Mountain, Nevada site. Well. This is where, this was, a, in my judgment, and in the judgment of many people, was a serious mistake. Uh, they, the better route should have probably been to let the uh, process, the decision-making process, play itself out and let the facts and the evidence and the information uh, uh, manifest itself as to, indeed, which was the best site. And, however, they did not do that. Uh, it was a very costly process. They thought that probably the Yucca Mountain site had some advantages over the other sites, uh, and it was also on a, in a location where there were some low-level waste uh, uh, disposal areas, and there, to many people it made sense to just uh, leapfrog uh, the evaluation process of reducing three sites down to one and characterize the Yucca Mountain site. Uh, as I say, probably a mistake. Uh, so far, I haven't even told you what high-level waste is. Uh, uh, it's defined in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission regulations. That definition was carried forward in the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. And basically, what high-level waste is, is material that has been irradiated in a reactor, and most notably, uh, the fuel and the internals uh, in the reactor, are, and any of the byproducts of the uh, spent fuel after it leaves the reactors. In the case, in, if they reprocess the fuel, uh, then the, the, the product from the reprocessing activity was also considered spent fuel. And then there was uh, the caveat that said that uh, essentially anything that's deemed high-level waste uh, will be uh, high-level waste. This is a clumsy definition. Uh, and, and unfortunately, a, a definition that was not adopted by other nations. Other nations were a little more clever and defined their waste on the basis of the radiation levels, uh, completely independent of its origin. This is a, a definition that was based on its origin. But still, the information was such that uh, uh, they amounted to somewhat the same thing, even though it was somewhat clumsy.
The types of waste we're talking about are basically in two farms. Uh, and the one farm that now is beginning and increasingly looking like it's going to be the main uh, waste farm is the spent fuel itself. Uh, the other farm is uh, particularly in the defense waste, uh, the situation where they take the spent fuel and reprocess it and recover the uh, uranium and plutonium for future applications, either as f fuel or in the case of the defense waste uh, for weapons. And then they take the uh, waste stream, which is full of the fission products and highly radioactive, and, and convert that to a waste farm that has high integrity, very stable, and presumably could last for a long time. And the waste farm that was selected was to put the waste in a glass matrix. It was called borosilicate glass, and it is a, a very stable uh, waste farm. So for the most part, what we're talking about in the United States is two waste farms. Fuel that's been used in the reactor, uh, that is to say spent fuel or used fuel, whichever you prefer, and uh, borosilicate glass, which is uh, where uh, primarily for the defense waste because we are not doing reprocessing uh, anymore in the United States. So this is what a fuel assembly looks like. There's two types of reactors that are the backbone of the world uh, nuclear power plant fleet, and they are what are called the light water reactors, and the two types are the so-called pressurized water reactor that was developed primarily through the Navy program and through uh, by Westinghouse, and the boiling water reactor, which were developed primarily uh, by uh, General Electric. Uh, so that will be, now in this uh, view graph, what we have is a little bit of the information on what this, where this waste is and what its general disposition uh, and amounts are. And as you can see, uh, the commercial waste uh, represents about 97% of, uh, of, of the waste volume. And this is surprising to a lot of people because they uh, remember the weapons program, the extensive amount of waste that exists at the nuclear laboratories such as Hanford, Savannah River, Idaho National Laboratory, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Oregon National Laboratory, but it's uh, two labs that are the principal houses or custodians, if you wish, of, of, of the defense waste, and they are Hanford and Savannah River. So, uh, but uh, the thing that, uh, point that needs to be made here is that the commercial waste is the waste that's growing. That's the waste that's increasing in extensively. And as we can see, it already dominates the total inventory uh, from the standpoint of spent nuclear fuel. Well, what about all fuel, all waste? Uh, spent fu uh, fuel together with the uh, so-called vitrified or borosilicate glass waste. Well, it <coughs> dominates there as well. Uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, waste uh, measured not in terms of, of weight or mass as this is, but in terms of its radioactive content uh, is about as, as has the same proportion here as we're seeing here on the uh, spent fuel. And in particular, at this point, there's about uh, 38 billion curies, curies being a measurement of radiation of, uh, of uh, uh, commercial waste. And we compare that with about a billion curies of defense waste. So it's the, it's the commercial waste that stands out as the uh, one that needs some attention and uh, has a lot to do with what will be my closing remarks. All right, what are the options that have been considered for high activity waste management? And I use the term high activity to uh, uh, mean both the high level waste as defined and spent fuel, uh, because I get tired of saying high level waste and spent fuel. So I often say just high activity waste. Here are the kinds, a few of the uh, approaches that have been taken in the past to, con uh, to consider how, what we do with this waste. Uh, burying the waste in deep sea sediments, uh, shooting it into space, uh, separating and transmutation. What we're talking about there is burning the waste nuclear-wise. It's not a combustion process, but it's a process of putting the waste 
in the right uh, environment and creating uh, nuclear reactions that either convert the waste to a stable state or converts it to uh, radionuclides that have very short half-lives. Uh, that is the most attractive approach from a physics standpoint, and it would be very nice if we could uh, do that. Uh, deep drilled boreholes, this is a case of taking the waste and burying it way below any level that we have considered in the past. In other words, in the, the boreholes they're talking about are, one, are three to five kilometers, one to three miles deep. Uh, small diameter, and why uh, boreholes, and why small diameter? Well, because that's what we know how to do. Uh, the uh, oil uh, industry knows how to do that today. We don't have to develop that technology. The problem with it is that in order to put the waste, these fuel elements in those boreholes, we have to handle it a lot. We have to uh, disassemble the rods from the assembled uh, fuel elements. And in many respects, the real risk is not so much the expectation of the failure of the repository as it is probably the handling that you have to do to prepare the waste for disposal. And so that's a, an option that has to be weighed very carefully. And there's a lot more R&D required with respect to what the impact will be of drilling such holes and putting heat uh, in them. That's the one property of uh, radioactive waste that changes uh, a lot of things, and that is that it's hot from a thermal standpoint as well as from a radioactive standpoint. Of course, storing the waste uh, is something we've been doing for a long, long time, and doing it successfully. Uh, but uh, the problem with uh, storing the waste and doing it uh, con and continuing to do it is, is it's, it's a little bit like just kicking the can down the road with respect to finding a permanent solution. And it is not a way to instill confidence in the public that there is, in fact, a permanent solution to the management of this material. Uh, so uh, we end up with something called deep mine geologic disposal. And uh, that's uh, if one has to pick uh, an option that seems to have the most credibility, that seems to have an inter international consensus that it'll work, and that seems to have an, a, an, an a number of countries that are well advanced in getting uh, their repository, uh, a deep geologic repository, uh, then there it seems to be mounting evidence that that has to be considered as uh, an attractive option. So with respect to geologic disposal, what does it depend on? Well, its success depends on our ability to indeed isolate the waste. Uh, and uh, what does that depend on. It depends on uh, the waste farm. I've already talked a little bit about what the waste farms are that are the primary uh, waste farms of, of current activities. Uh, and uh, it requires uh, understanding the effectiveness from a containment capability and a performance capability of the engineered barrier systems in the immediate vicinity of where the waste is in place. It depends on the uh, uh, mobilization and dissolution of the waste form uh, and, and understanding how that, what those mechanisms are and how that can or cannot happen. It depends on if we do have a mobilized waste stream, uh, then we depend upon the natural system. And there we have to understand the transport characteristics, the retention characteristics, the retardation characteristics of the, of the waste. Uh, and then, of course, we have to understand the pathways that are involved, particularly the biosphere. So uh, the geologic disposal has uh, uh, advanced a great deal. And the United States was in a strong position during the Yucca Mountain project. I'll come to that in a little while, uh, because we had uh, done a tremendous amount of underground research and answered a lot of questions and had built considerable confidence that it is possible, in fact, to isolate this waste for thousands and thousands of years. So what's the problem? Uh, well, at the bottom of the list here, I have technical. And that's right where it belongs, because it is uh, at the bottom of the list. The biggest problems are gaining the confidence of the public that this is a solvable problem. 
And uh, one of the things that has handicapped developing public confidence is that the nation has never really demonstrated itself as having a national will to solve the problem. It's very difficult to develop public trust when the leadership, and this goes for all political parties, when the leadership has failed to uh, uh, take charge of the problem and created the, the interest and the will to go forward and solve it. It doesn't exist. It's not like the building of the atomic bomb. It's not like the uh, development of the nuclear submarine program. It's not like uh, going to the moon, uh, where we indeed had a national will and we were able to accomplish some amazing things in very short periods of time. We've been wrestling with this problem for 50 years. And in my judgment, uh, the biggest problem and the reason we're not uh, with the solution today is not necessarily because we don't understand the technical aspects of it, although I admit there's some technical aspects we have to work on, but it's because the, the leadership has not been willing to uh, address it. Uh, it, it, it they, there is a, t a concern about the political implications if they do address it, and it's kind of caught in the middle in terms of having uh, the, nece the leadership necessary to move forward. So, uh, that when the national, when the Yucca Mountain project was uh, shelved, uh, could be permanent, could be temporarily, uh, uh, the, we, we no longer had a program that was going on. So right now our, our situation is doing R&D, but we really have no specific program going on. We have not really acted yet on the recommendations of a Blue Ribbon Commission that was established to uh, make uh, recommendations to the president as to what the direction should be. Uh, the administration has chosen not to address it um, for obvious reasons. They don't want to get into this topic until after the election. And so uh, at the moment, nothing much is happening uh, except uh, a, a study phase. Site selection. This is, a, this is probably the key problem. As, along with a developing uh, a consensus uh, view uh, of public support. Uh, the experts on the board, and, and they are uh, some distinguished uh, uh, geochemists and, and earth scientists, are of the opinion that you could put a, a needle in, on a US map on the lower 48 at any point, and within 300 miles of that point, probably find an adequate site. So there is high confidence uh, among the scientific community and among the earth science community in particular that there's no problem in finding sites. Uh, the problem is finding a site that uh, is hosted by uh, the public or by a region or by a community and supported. And that's where a lot of emphasis is now going to be given in any future endeavor in this regard. Uh, there are technical issues. Uh, some of them are, are highlighted here. Uh, probably the number one technical issue is trying to predict the performance of a natural system involving uh, several cubic kilometers of real estate over hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, and, and in the case of Yucca Mountain, the challenge was to do it for a million years. Uh, that's uh, a very difficult thing to do, but the world uh, and the international work that has gone on has indicated that it's not a hopeless task. It's a difficult task, but uh, as I'll mention in a couple of moments, uh, there has been an enormous amount of progress made in being able to uh, uh, establish uh, a long uh, performance time for, for these repositories. Characterization of the natural system is not an easy thing. That's why you see a quite a bit of emphasis in the vicinity near where the waste is emplaced on engineered barriers because it's much easier in general to uh, design to an engineering specification than it is to characterize several uh, kil kilometers, cubic kilometers of real estate to the same level of detail. Uh, so it, 
the, the, the combination that has worked well so far is a combination of the near field being heavily engineered with protective barriers and hopefully uh, in, a, in a geologic medium where uh, the natural system provides substantial amount of defense and depth. One of the most important calculations that has to be made in a repository is something called the radionuclide source term. And what we mean by that is, is uh, defining the form, the quantity, and the rate of release of radionuclides over all time, if you wish, essentially, uh, from the vicinity of the emplacement. And in the case of the Yucca Mountain, the models that were developed were some of which were really very outstanding. But the one that was not so outstanding was the one having to do with the mo how the mo representing how the uh, waste actually becomes mobilized. The models that were done with respect to the corrosion of the waste packages and the failure and degradation of the engineered barriers were excellent. And there was great confidence built that you in fact could build a waste package, you could build engineered barriers to provide high confidence that they would maintain their integrity for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and possibly even a million years. And there are issues, there are always issues of, of, of quantifying the transport of radionuclides in different geologic media, but uh, it's not something that uh, can't be done, and in fact, in that area, uh, the work was quite outstanding. So what is it from a technical standpoint, what is it from a waste standpoint that makes the problem complex? Well, of course, it's radionuclides. Uh, what, you, what you do with a, with a reactor, a nuclear reactor, is you take a fuel assembly that essentially has no radiation, and you run it for uh, a year or 18 months or two years, and you have manufactured through nuclear processes some 300 uh, radionuclides that weren't there before, all of which are radioactive. And there are multiple types of radiation in this regard. There's the fission products themselves uh, that result directly from the fissioning of the uranium atoms. Uh, there's the activation of, of the reactor internals as a result of uh, uh, nuclear reactions. There's the formation and transformation of some of the elements into heavier elements that don't fission necessarily, but are radioactive. And those elements, uh, a, a class that is in that category, are called the actinides. These are the uh, met metallic uh, elements uh, that have atomic numbers from 89 to uh, 103. Uh, and most, and they all are radioactive. And most of them do not occur naturally. The uranium does but uh, the plutonium, americium, and, and neptunium, and, and, and other plutonium isotopes do not. So, uh, and then there's a, a fourth source of radiation, and that's that some of these heavy elements, like americium, uh, 241, uh, have a, 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 a they, they fission spontaneously. So you have the fission products, you have the activation products, you have the transformation products, and you have spontaneous fission all me mechanisms for creating uh, radioactive material. Uh, now, uh, some of these materials, fortunately, the 300 uh, nuclides, radionuclides that you have that you didn't start with, it turns out that only a, 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 a half a dozen of those, that's just the good news, really drive uh, the risk associated with the repositories. Most of them, either because of low biological consequences are because of very short half-lives disappear. Uh, some of them are more of a nuisance because of their heat content than their radioactive content, such as strontium and cesium. Uh, they are both uh, radionuclides of about 30-year half-lives. Uh, these contributed mostly to the heat, and heat becomes a very important factor in the design of a repository because it impacts uh, the rock thermoconductivity and the whole ability of the waste to migrate away from, the, uh, from its emplacement area. But the good news there is that after a few hundred years, it, it has decayed out and it's not a problem. 
And after several thousands of years, the actinides uh, become the principal uh, contributor to heat. And they also become, uh, along with a couple of fission products, uh, technetium-99 uh, and iodine-129 uh, become, for the most part, the drivers for uh, determining the performance of the repository. Technetium-99 has a half-life of, of something like 200,000 years. Iodine-129 is more like 17 million years. And some of the transuranics or some of the actinides, like neptunium, has a half-life of a couple million years. So those four or five uh, radionuclides are the ones we have to deal with uh, the most. Uh, now, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the Yucca Mountain Project uh, and tell you uh, what, we're, what we got out of your $13 billion investment. Uh, <laughs> This was a, an amazing project, and, and the, the uh, Department of Energy was kind of put in a difficult position here uh, uh, because they get a lot of the blame for a lot of the problems, but they were put in the difficult position of justifying this and departing from a program that they were uh, operating of a more systematic and deliberate evolution of, uh, of a site. Uh, so the idea here was to uh, characterize the site to, uh, by characterizing, define the properties that would have anything to do with uh, compromising the ability of the site to uh, completely isolate the waste. And one of the projects that was very expensive but also very uh, informative was the development of an explore, exploratory studies tunnel. Uh, so that what they did is they went to the side of the mountain at about the level uh, of where the uh, waste in, would be in place, at about 2,000 feet below the top of the mountain, or 1,000 feet below the top of the mountain, about 1,000 feet above the saturated region. And in an unsaturated region, drove a 25-foot tunnel into the mountain that ended up being about five miles long. And then off this tunnel, uh, there were several alcoves and niches that became laboratories, so to speak, where they measured the critical parameters that were needed in order to determine the performance of the repository. Parameters uh, like infiltration rate, parameters like the effect of heat on the conductivity, uh, rock conductivity, uh, parameters like what is the atmosphere going to be uh, in, the, in the waste package area. The corrosion scientists will tell us that if you can tell me what the environment is in terms of moisture, in terms of material, I can, I can predict uh, the corrosion rates. Uh, that was a big challenge. So in addition, and, and it was the board, uh, our uh, technical review board, that had a lot to do with uh, the design of the tunnel and the uh, very pr uh, presence of the tunnel. We also recommended, and they implemented that recommendation, that there be another tunnel, a cross tunnel, not so big as the exploratory tunnel, that goes directly into and cross cuts a great amount of the region where the uh, emplacement tunnels would exist, and develop some experiments for that. So this was a, 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 a really quite an outstanding uh, project and headed in the right direction. The site is not a particularly perfect site. Uh, it's uh, an unsaturated site, but uh, the site has a considerable number of fractures. It has a, a history of, of some seismic events. And of course, the whole site is a result of igneous events of many millennia ago. But still, uh, there seemed to be a high confidence that it could be made to work. Uh, so, this next thing is to just illustrate, and I'm not going to go into it, uh, the extent of the waste package design. This was an elaborate process. This was a, a, an attempt to put the fuel assemblies uh, uh, and, and the vitrified waste in waste packages that were indeed designed to last for tens of thousands and even hundreds of thousands of years. And they settled on certain it's very uh, sophisticated alloys uh, for doing that. And this is just kind of is a quick snapshot of the layers of, of barriers that were involved in 
in uh, covering the, the material. And here's uh, a rendering of uh, how the different waste packages, how the waste packages would contain the different waste. The first one is uh, a, the PWR assemblies. The second one is defense waste. It's a co-disposal of uh, vitrified waste or borosilicate glass uh, matrix and uh, spent fuel assemblies from the defense work. And then the one towards the back is the BWR. And then you'll notice also in the back is a, a shield around the waste to deflect any infiltration of moisture or water. That shield was to be made of titanium and uh, the amount of titanium that was needed to do that was at the, at the time pretty much well in excess of, of the total inventory that was available. But it was a pretty sophisticated design and it was a design to try to cover all the waste farms that might exist. So what has been the impact uh, of the government with respect to doing this kind of a project? Uh, it's not been good. Uh, the, 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 the budgeting process has been very complex in spite of the fact that the ratepayers of nuclear power plants are billed uh, a, a tenth of a mil per kilowatt hour and had accumulated uh, uh, a fund of some 30 to 40 billion dollars uh, and but that is but these acts as you all know have clauses in them that the money can be spent for other things but they are committed to uh, they are committed to fund this at, at some point uh, and they also require the Department of Energy to fight for this budget yearly. And it, I, and it was just kind of a random experiment that some of the uh, uh, board members ran. We would go to the scientists, and it was amazing that about 30% of their time seemed to be spent on developing technical information that would justify the next budget request. It's just a very awkward and inefficient system. Uh, uh, it's a project that was extremely vulnerable to political uh, processes. And of course, when you had, uh, uh, when, when the site was selected, uh, the senator from Nevada, Harry Reid, was really disturbed by the selection because he thought the only reason Nevada was selected was because they had one of the smallest congressional delegations of any of the sites that were under consideration. And he was right about the fact that they had the smallest delegation congressional delegation, but uh, he, from that moment, from the day it was announced that they were going to only characterize Yucca Mountain, was a strong proponent, and of course his power increased with time, and he finally got uh, President Obama to commit to uh, sh uh, shutting down the project, and, um, and Obama, of course, lived up to his promise in that regard. So. The problem, the project was, was doomed to problems uh, from the beginning. Another thing that's very difficult with this project is the management. Um, being a national program, and with all the clauses that are inherent in national program projects of spreading the work around, it, in, it was really uh, difficult to implement uh, the project because of the need for involving all the national labs and all and a variety of parties in, in the process. And it just was not conducive to an efficient uh, exercise. And then there was always the problem of transitioning from a science project to an engineering project. They finally got a director of the project uh, that was a real manager. And in a year's time, uh, he made more progress uh, with respect to moving the project forward than most of his, uh, all of his predecessors. So it was clear that it could be done, but it had to have leadership that for the most part it never had. But in spite of that, there were a number of, 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 of accomplishments. Uh, no, there had never been much work done in the earth science field in analyzing uh, the transport of material in unsaturated uh, media. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the work that had been done is primarily focused on where there's groundwater um, and substantial amounts of what and how that groundwater moves through the geologic units. Uh, so the, the techniques that were developed to do that were really outstanding. 
There are a number of models that were developed to account for water balancing and, uh, and having accountability of where the water goes, uh, and models to account for runoff, the evaporation, transpiration, uh, and so on. Better understanding of the effect of uh, capillary forces, that is to say, uh, being able to dis, uh, influence the, the uh, surrounding area of the emplaced waste such that the water di is diverted. Uh, it, 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 capillary forces being uh, having to do with the molecular and surface tension of, of liquids and its ability under certain conditions to go against gravity. Uh, the, the, we call it sometimes the wicking phenomena as in the old coal oil lamps. Mapping techniques for locating faults and past volcanic activity. Some of the models that were developed and some of the analysis that were performed in that area were absolutely first of a kind and first rate. Greatly improved understanding of seismic and igneous hazards. How to date them, how to establish the level of activity, and uh, how to get a better handle on the, their frequency of occurrence and their severity. Improved state of the art of expert elicitation methods. Uh, in this, in the, some phenomena, all you really have in the absence of direct experience is the expert's view of uh, how an event could happen. That whole process has been pretty much fine-tuned in the nuclear community, way beyond what it has been used and how it's been developed in other uh, fields. Alternatives for controlling the temperatures in the repository. Temperature is an extremely important phenomena because the elevated temperatures compromise the confidence in the analytical tools that were employed uh, to analyze performance because never in uh, the earth science world had uh, they had to operate in those kind of temperatures under those kind of conditions. And then finally, uh, there is... Uh, great deal of improvement in the performance assessments and in the adoption of a probabilistic approach that uh, gives you insights and a much greater understanding of the uh, uh, uncertainties that are involved uh, because the uncertainties are absolutely important in the whole decision-making process. Okay. Now, what are the alternatives? We, we looked at the alternatives early on uh, with respect to uh, in the early years, but what are the alternatives today? Well, there's increasing evidence that uh, multiple geologic formations uh, uh, can accommodate a repository. That's probably the single biggest uh, state of knowledge uh, change that has existed over the last two or three decades. Uh, the concept of on-site dry storage has gone a long way to relieving the pressure of running out of space in their spent fuel pools at the reactor sites. After the fuel, spent fuel is in the uh, spent fuel pools for five to ten years, it's the temperatures and the decaying has advanced to a point where dry storage is a feasible option. And that option is being exercised extensively now. Interim uh, centralized storage, that's kind of the push that I probably would, that's probably going to happen, is to build a, uh, a inter, interim uh, storage facility. Deep boreholes, a lot of R&D required before that's going to surface as a viable uh, alternative. And if it is ever a viable alternative, it'll only be for the waste farms that have absolutely no chance of having any value in the future. Partitioning and transmutation, long ways off, costs too much money, uh, and you need a much greater infrastructure than now exists in order for that to be an, a, a feasible concept. So uh, now this is actually my, my last slide. Uh, what should we do? And, and as I say, this is strictly my own opinion. Uh, and I think that uh, the, the, the information that I presented earlier about the disposition of the waste how much of it is defense, how much of it is commercial, which component of it is growing the most, which component of it is declining. The defense component is definitely declining. The commercial component is increasing uh, considerably. Uh, 
my view is that we should, we should uh, take the step that's necessary here and make a permanent solution the top priority. And that permanent solution should uh, be supported with international consensus, which is a, a deep geologic disposal. Not a deep borehole, but uh, uh, more in the range of a few thousand meters or even a few hundred meters than in the range of one to, or three to five uh, kilometers. Go with the international consensus. Deep geologic disposal. Uh, three countries have committed to a site. Uh, uh, France has uh, uh, committed to filing a license application in 2015. Uh, Finland is filing an application later this year for a, a, and have selected a site. Sweden uh, has filed an application a couple of years ago and has a site and those programs are aggressively moving forward such that they will have their repository sometime in the 20s. Uh, the idea that you should uh, simplify the transportation problem and maximize the benefits to the host community leads you to uh, the concept of co-locating these facilities basically at the same site. And uh, what I mean by co-locating is the storage, uh, the research, both above ground and below ground research laboratories, and uh, a repository. And of course, uh, most importantly, implement a consensus building siting strategy with public participation. Otherwise, it's just simply not going anywhere. So with that, uh, I think I'm right on schedule. And I'm uh, open to questions. Uh, from <laughs>